Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. And happy Halloween. We welcome you today to our devotional. I want to recognize those who are seated on the stand. My wife, Susan Tanner, our speaker, Lurleen Nuna, Nunu, excuse me, and her sister, Grace Aliasa, who will be introducing her. We also want to recognize representatives from our stake presidencies that serve on campus. From the YSA First Stake, President Malifihi Neil Tupuivaha, and from the Married Stake, Student Stake, President Steve Tuller. We also recognize from the Polynesian Cultural Center our dear friend, President Alfred Grace, as well as members of our BYU Hawaii President's Council and members of the Student Leadership Team from the Office of Student Leadership and Service. Next Tuesday's devotional will be Elder Charles Gu, the university chaplain and a very longtime member of our community. Our opening hymn today will be As Zion's Youth in Latter Days, hymn number 256. Our chorister this morning is Kirsten Huddleston, and our organist is Jennifer Durden. Following the opening hymn, the invocation will be offered by Salu Ita, a junior from Spring Creek, Nevada, majoring in English literature. Selu served in the Missouri Independence Mission. And we'll then hear a scripture that has been chosen and will be read by Tiara uh, Tuio Lo Senga, a sophomore from American Samoa, majoring in political science. Following the scripture, we'll be favored with a musical number, Ave Verum, composed by Charles Gounod and directed by Sister Esther Macy, sung by the University Chorale with Jennifer Durden on the organ. And now our opening hymn, As Zion's Youth in Latter Days. Our dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for this beautiful day that thou hast provided for us. We are grateful for this opportunity that we have as thy children to be gathered together to listen to the words that have inspired to be given to us. 
We are grateful for Sister Nunu's diligence in preparing for this. And we ask to please bless her at this time, that as she speaks to us, the Spirit will touch her as well as all of those in this company. We ask a blessing to be upon all of us as we go through our different trials and difficulties. We'll be able to be supported and that we'll be able to feel uplifted through this meeting. And we ask you these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe.
Thank you for your thank you for your music. Today's devotional speaker is Sister Lurleen Nunu. Sister uh, Nunu will be introduced by her sister, Grace Aleasa, and following Sister Nunu's devotional message, the benediction will be offered by Sala Sasungi, a sophomore from Apia, Samoa, majoring in hospitality and tourism management. Sala served in the Philippines Legaspi Mission. And now, Sister Aleaspa. I have the honor of introducing my sister, Lurleen Sianini Nunu. I've always thought she had the prettiest name. And growing up, I wondered, where did my Samoan parents find that beautiful name? My dad said she was named after a big, beautiful ship. It's so fitting. She's my big, beautiful sister. And because of her job, she is always traveling from coast to coast. I'm so excited she's taking me to Fiji in December. <laughs> one, one of us is in denial. <laughs> I don't know how to express in a few words who she is. So I will tell you what she is. First and foremost, she's a daughter of God. She, like my mother, is a God-fearing woman. She has a fierce testimony of this gospel. She is a mother. I will not say that she is a single mother. I'm sure you've heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. In Laie, there is no such thing as a single mother. She, along with her family and her village, have proudly raised Mark Nunu, who is a corrections officer, and Yosia Nunu, who is a senior at Kahuku High School. She is a grandmother. If you ask her to name three of her favorite things, she would definitely say eight-year-old twins, Huali Aloha and Kikai Halai Nunu, and everybody's boss, three-year-old Kilinahe Nunu. I am definitely number four. She is educated. She's a proud Red Raider for Life, Kahuku class of 1973. She was so smart when she came from Samoa that they allowed her to skip a grade, and she graduated at age 16. She also received a bachelor's degree in travel management from this fine institution. She's a hard worker. Her first job at age 15 at the Polynesian Culture Center was working in the Samoan village and dancing in the night show. Fast forward 40 years, and she is still here working and ser serving this community as the manager of your BYU travel office. She is a servant. She has never said no to a church calling and over the years has served in many capacities. Her latest calling shocked all of us. She is the ward organist. It was shocking because none of us knew she could play. It just goes to prove that if the Lord calls you, he qualifies you for the work. Last but not least, because it is Halloween, I have to say that she's a witch. <laughs> it's not what you think. She's a good witch. A good witch is caring, accepting, honorable, respectful, forgiving, forthright, fearless, resourceful, independent, wise, and loyal. A good witch does not harm, does not wish harm on another. A good witch understands the statement, you get what you give and has gratitude for everything in her life. A good witch has a pure and loving heart. A good witch works for the good of all. Please help me welcome my sister, the good witch, Lurli Nunu.
My dear brothers and sisters, aloha, aloha. and talofa. I would like to thank Sister Macy for that, and the choir for that wonderful musical number, and of course my sister Grace for that wonderful introduction. I want you to know that Grace is not my sister. She's actually my aunt. You see, Grace is already sealed in the temple to my grandparents, my mom's parents. So in the next life, she's my mom's sister. Thank you, Auntie Grace. Can you feel my heart? I bet you can't because it's not working. I'm only depending on the spirit to deliver the message that I have prepared for all of you today. First, I would like to thank President Tanner, our wonderful president and his wife for this golden opportunity for me to address you today. This past Saturday, I was taking my twin grandbabies home and in the car I said, hey, don't forget grandma's devotional on Tuesday. Grandma's going to speak. Huali, the oldest twin, asked, Grandma, who asked you to speak? I said, the president of the university, President Tanner. How come he asked you to speak? Uh, maybe because I'm special? She excitedly said, yay, I can't wait for him to ask me to speak. <laughs> Hala'i, her sister, quickly said, not me, no thanks. My grandbabies are just beginning to find their voice and learn how to sing gospel truths. Huali, realized that she's very special. Halai realized that she can be quick on her feet and make decisions right away. And the little three-year-old, well, she's the boss of those two. She's also my boss, and she's the boss of everyone. I love them with all my heart. My dear friend Irene Lesuma and I were in the temple one Saturday morning waiting for our turn to do initiatory, and she asked me, hey sis, how are you doing with your devotional preparations? I told her, it's coming along. She shared with me that morning of her devotional, she cried in her room and she asked, Heavenly Father, are you really there? I just smile and giggle. I really wanted to laugh, but um, we were in the temple. She reassured me that I will do just fine. I would like to tell my dear friend Irene that Heavenly Father was definitely there for her devotional and she found her voice and shared with us beautiful melodies of the gospel and were both wonderful and inspiring. Now for this morning, after I said my morning prayer, I was too excited to cry as my heart was racing. Master, the tempest is raging. I know by the end of our devotional, I will gladly say, Master, the terror is over. Peace, peace, be still. I grew up in the village of Fiti Uta Manua in American Samoa. Fiti Uta is one of the three villages on the main island of Ta'u Manua. It is 70 miles east of the main island of Tatuila, American Samoa. In the 1960s, I lived in the village of Fiti Uta with my family until I was 12 years old when we moved here to Hawaii. The only form of transportation between the main island of Tatuila and Manua was a small steamship that travels there once a week. There is no wharf, or, so the ship would dock out in the blue ocean, and the villagers would row a longboat out to meet the ship and pick up supplies and the passengers. It is very dangerous and wet, especially when the tide is high. I remember one of those trips, our family were told to wait for two missionaries that will be coming to Tutuila, from Tutuila to Fitiuta. So our family went to the shore to wait for the ship to arrive. I was watching from the shore as the men of the village rowed the longboat out to meet the ship. And for some reason, my dad wasn't on the longboat. I saw two missionaries with white shirts standing on the edge of the ship, getting ready to jump onto the longboat, but they were stopped by some of the men, indicating they are not to board the longboat. However, the men reached out for the missionary suitcases. When they got the suitcases for the missionaries, they threw them in the blue ocean, and I could see the suitcases floating away. My father saw what was happening to our Palangi Caucasian missionaries, so he waited until the longboat returned to shore. When they returned, my dad jumped in the longboat and told the men of the village that the two missionaries are ministers of his church, and they are supposed to respect and honor them, just like how he respect their minister of their LMS church. So the men, and along with my dad, went back to the ship and picked up our two missionaries. I'm not sure about their suitcases, though. They were shocked and probably wished that they could go back to Tutuila on the steamship right then and there, but they stayed. 
It was this experience that was the beginning of the missionaries' journey of finding their voice in the village of Fiti Uta and find ways to continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our family were the only members of the church in the village of Fiti Uta. As you can see in this picture, my beautiful mom, and she is holding me. My mom's parents, the man with the white hair and my grandma next to him, that's Grace's parents. They are my sister Grace's parents in the next life. The tall Palangi elder in the back standing next to my dad and the rest of my own family, my siblings, cousins, uncle, and my dad's mother, Malia. The rest of the village belonged to the LMS Congregational Church. We didn't have a chapel. I don't think we were officially a branch of the church, but missionaries were sent to our village because our family were members of the church. Our Sunday meetings were held at my grandfather's house. We only had sacrament meeting, which consists of an opening prayer and song, talks from the missionaries, and blessings and passing of the sacrament, closing song and prayer. We didn't have primary. I didn't know any primary songs, but somehow in my young life, through the teachings of the missionaries and my parents, I knew I am a child of God. And he has sent me here, has given me an earthly home with parents kind and dear. I am a child of God, and so my needs are great. Help me to understand his words before it grows too late. I am a child of God, which blessings are in store. If I but learn to do his will, I'll live with him once more. Lead me, guide me, walk beside me, help me find the way. Teach me all that I must do to live with him someday. Finding my voice and learning how to sing started at a very young age. My dad loved to play the guitar and sing those old Samoan folk songs that has 12 verses and 12 choruses. Thank goodness my dad had a nice voice. It would have been very difficult and problematic to listen to 12 vers verses, 12 choruses of the same song every day. My father played the trumpet. I don't know who gave him the trumpet, but he would blow the trumpet in the morning before he goes to the plantation and at night after dinner. But I think it was more of a show off type of thing with my dad because he was the only one in the village that had a trumpet and he wasn't really playing an actual song. He would just blow two notes and hold it really long as if it was a song, he would stop and he would clean the trumpet. You know, the village would see him cleaning it up. He would kind of making it like he was really a professional trumpet player. He got better as time went on. Some of you, now my mother played the piano and sings very well. Some of you might remember those days, the piano, where you had to pump it with two feet in order for the piano to work. My two older sisters stayed with my grandparents, but me and my brother stayed with my parents, so we were exposed to music and these musical instruments while we were growing up. My brother is an accomplished guitar player and singer. He also plays the trumpet. My mom taught me how to play the piano and how to sing. I only knew how to play one song in the Psalm 1 hymn book, Ia Fia Fia Pia. It had no flats or sharps, but it got my interest in playing the piano at a very young age. I was so proud to be able to play that one song on the piano. In fact, my mother would sometimes ask me to play that one song during our Sunday meetings. So who was showing off now? <laughs> when I think about it now, my father was was actually showing off for the right reasons. You see, it was their musical talent and abilities that helped my parents and family to preach the gospel to the people of Fiti Uta Manua. Our missionaries were not allowed to proselyte or go to, into the people's homes. The people refused to hear about Joseph Smith. In fact, they would tease us and call us names like, eh, Yosefa Samita Pepelo, meaning Joseph Smith is a liar or Joseph Smith's story is a false. The missionaries forged ahead with their work, even when rejection by the people were a normal day for them. President Hinckley, in one of his conference talks titled, Joseph Smith, Truly a Prophet, said that an acquaintance said to him one day, quote, I admire your church very much. I think I could accept everything about it, except Joseph Smith. To which I responded, quote, that statement is a contradiction. If you accept the revelation, you must accept the revelator, close quote. As the missionaries continued to find ways to preach the gospel, one of the things that they did was to have our own activities, our mutual nights. The non-member children and youth in the village would come to our mutual nights and just sit outside and watch from outside at my grandfather's house. They would listen to our music and watch us do our activities. They never asked to join us, although we invited them. They were just curious as to what the Mormons were doing on Thursday night and Sunday nights when we have our firesides. These were the same children of those parents in the village that refused to let our missionaries into their homes. They were the same kids that were teased me and my brother at school or after school that we were mongamongas, cockroaches, 
rhymes with the word mamonga in Samoan, which means Mormon in English. A lot of verbal confrontations and throwing of rocks those days between me, between us and the kids of the village. I'm still alive today because I was very good at alo, or dodging, when the rocks are coming my way or run fast to get out of the way. Our missionaries experienced the same treatment from the people of Fiti Uta. In DNC chapter 6, verse 32 to 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I said unto my disciples, where two or three are gathered together in my name, as touching one thing, behold, there will be one in the midst of them, even so am I in the midst of you. Fear not to do good, my sons, for whatsoever he sow, that he shall also reap. Therefore, if he sow good, he shall also reap good for your reward. Therefore, fear not, little flock, do good. Let earth and hell combine against you. For if he are built upon the rock, they cannot prevail. We as members of the church were solid as a rock in our testimony of the gospel, even when the real rocks were thrown to us and the missionaries. Nothing is to compare to what our earlier missionaries went through and suffered because of the stubborn people of Fiti Uta at that time. This was way before my parents and our family moved to Fiti Uta. One of those missionaries was but the man by the name of Papo Funemuana. O Papo Funemuana, Fonomuana is called Fonomuana's grandfather. Ka wrote and presented a paper at the Mormon Pacific Historical Society Conference here on campus back in 1980. The paper entitled O Papo, Man of Miracles. This story is in the historical archives here in our school library. In that paper, Ka wrote about his grandfather's many miracles as he preached the gospel in Samoa. One of those places that he was sent to was Manua. Ka wrote his grandfather had a dream and in his dream, he saw two Palangi Faifeaus, Caucasian missionaries, foreign missionaries, came to the village and walked right into his house and sat down. That was the end of his dream. But later on, when two Mormon missionaries entered into their village and came up to his house and walked in, he not only recognized the two of the men in his dream, by his own account, the spirit told him that the gospel message was true. It was then the stage was set for this simple man to do great work for the church. Call continue. O Papo Fonemuana is longtime friend Elisala, and two white missionaries were sent to Manua. When they arrived, they found that their arrival has been forewarned and that the king to Manua had given strict instructions. He's trying to bring up the signal again. When they arrived, they found they were forewarned that the King Tumanua has given strict instructions forbidding anyone from receiving, housing, feeding, clothing, or assisting the Mormon missionaries in any way. It was a difficult situation for all concerned. Even though some people may have wanted to accept the missionaries and care for them as in a normal custom of care and assist the ministers, the fear of reprisals from the dominant king, his harsh edit, was too much for anyone to go against. The consequence of accepting these missionaries would be an immediate stoning of that individual or individuals. The prospects of any conversion was hopeless. Nevertheless, the missionaries were very determined and stayed two months on Manua. Without food to eat, they relied heavily on falling coconuts and beach, on the beaches and small staples. Without a fale or a house for shelter or sleeping, they had to dig holes on the beach. They would enter the deep holes and the last one would cover their heads with leaves as to protect them from mosquitoes. Each one taking a turn nightly to help the others arrange their leaves and then unassisted himself, suffering from mosquito bites the rest of the night. After several weeks of grueling ordeal, Opapo was awakened by the smell of some freshly baked food in a nearby basket. The missionaries did not know whether through human or divine source, but after weeks of coconuts, they were profoundly grateful. Near the end of their stay, the incident was repeated when an elderly woman brought them food, saying that if she had to die for her kindness, she would, but she not, did not fear Tuimanua. A, weeks, a few weeks later, after exhausting every possible avenue, the missionaries prepared to depart. 
Ceremonially, Opapo and Elisala spoke directly to Tuimanua and his people, warning them that they would feel the wrath and the power of God if they did not repent. As his last act before boarding the longboat, Opapo at the edge of the village and dusted off his feet as a witness against the island. A couple of weeks later, a devastating hurricane struck the island, killing many, destroying all of the crops above ground, and leveling every house except one hut and one folly. And that was the hut of the elderly lady that helped them and the missionaries. It is true that miracles strengthen the faith of believers, but do not necessarily, necessarily give faith to the unbelieving, close quote. In DSC chapter 75, verse 18 to 20, yea, let all those take their journey as I have commanded them, going from house to house, from village to village, from city to city, and in whatsoever house ye enter and they receive you, leave your blessing upon that house. In whatsoever house he enter and receive you not, he shall depart speedily from that house, shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. I would like to believe that the elderly woman that helped Opapo and the missionaries was my grandmother, Malia. She is my dad's mother. And if it wasn't her, then it is definitely something my grandmother, Malia, would do. She was a convert to the church. She too had a dream. In her dream, she saw two personages wearing white, appearing on her ulu tree or breadfruit tree in front of her house or hut. When she awoke in the morning, she shared her dream with her family. She noticed that her ulu tree in front of her house or hut has now bare two types of breadfruits, one ulu maopo and one ulu maafala. It was then she knew that the church was true and she was baptized. That ulu tree continued to bear two types of breadfruits, and it was a symbol of my grandmother's testimony to everybody that came to Fiti Uta Manua of the truthfulness of the gospel. That story has been told many times, and the ulu tree became a landmark where people would go and see and be amazed. It was through this dream that my grandmother found her voice and never, never stopped singing and bearing her testimony about Joseph Smith and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Missionaries continued to come to Fiti Uta, and one of those great missionaries was Elder Larry Oler. Many of you that have been here in the community and here on campus know of this great man, Brother Larry Oler. I used to call him Daddy O. Oler. He was like a second dad to me. He married my parents when he was in, on his mission in Fiti Uta. It wasn't until we moved to Laie from Samoa that I was introduced to Brother Oler and his wife, Pat, and their 10 wonderful children. We were in the same ward for a very long time. He was the dean of students here on campus, and he helped a lot of students, especially Pacific Islanders, since he served both in Samoa and New Zealand as principal of church schools. Elder Older helped my dad strengthen his testimony of the gospel, especially about the word of wisdom. My dad stopped smoking kapa'a, Samoan cigarettes, and was ordained the Aaronic priesthood. My father's testimony and faith were tested when he went against the rules of the village. The Matai system in the village was very prevalent, and they had strict rules that governor, governed the affairs of the village. My dad was part of the Almanga, the young single and married man of this village that takes care of some of the affairs of the village. He continued to serve with the village Almanga, even as a member of the church. That was his duty to serve in the village. The men of the village were not pleased with him because he became a Mormon. Those days, the village worshipped certain idols of a prominent king or high chief of stature in Manua. They built a ba, a tower of black rocks. This is situated right in the pathway or walkway where the people of the village pass or walk to their plantations or go fishing. They are expected to pay their respect when they pass the tower of black rocks with complete silence. At this time, my father's testimony of the church was solid. He knew there is only one God and we should not worship idols. So he decided that he was going to destroy this tower of rocks and he did. The Matais of the village heard about it and discovered that their idol tower was completely demolished and it was no longer there. So the word went around the village and it was told to my dad and my family that my dad will die the very next day. Well, my father not only moved his family from Samoa to Hawaii in 1969 so he could be sealed in the temple and for his children to have a better education, he retired from BYU Hawaii as a landscaper and worked as an ordinance worker in the temple until his passing. My dad didn't know any English when he arrived here, so how did he become a temple ordinance worker if he didn't know any English? He self-taught himself by pronouncing the words and asked his children to help him pronounce it back and vice versa. President David Hanneman, then the president of La Ia Hawaii Temple, would always tell me when he sees me that, quote, your father is a very spiritual man and he takes his work in the temple very seriously. 
I would find your dad in an empty room in the temple, praying and studying, close quote. He continued to be this kind of example to us, his children, and to others. He would probably tell us, you know, I work as a landscaper at BYU, and they are my boss. But when the professors come to the temple, I am their boss. <laughs> he was so proud to work in the temple as an session officiator. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, for whosoever, for whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He knew the church was true, and he would give his life for it. There was a story that was told by one of the apostles in the conference talk about a child being trapped in a hole in the ground who could only be extricated by sending another smaller child into the tunnel. One little fellow was approached to see if he would be willing to go down and rescue the one who was lodged. The lad said, I am scared to go in that hole, but I will if my father will hold that rope. My father found his voice in the gospel in Jesus Christ, and he never stopped wonder, never stopped singing those wonderful and righteous melodies of the gospel. He has been holding that rope for me, and my sibling has never, ever let go. He taught us children, and he knew he taught us children what he knew, and he never stopped teaching us, even when it was difficult for him at times. My dad was a fifth grade dropout. He stopped going to school to take care of his mother. He was a fisherman by trade and worked very hard in his plantation every day. He would go to his plantation in the mountain and gather coconuts and dry the coconut meat out in the sun and then sell the dry meat to the government to make oil. And this was the way he earned money for, for our airfares to come to Hawaii. In the talk given by Elder Russell M. Ballard entitled, Let Our Voices Be Heard, he stated, the family is at the heart of Heavenly Father's plan because we are all part of his family and because mortality is our opportunity to form our own families and to assume our role of parent. It is within our families that we learn unconditional love, which can come to us and draw us close to God's love. It is within families that values are taught and character is built. Father and mother are callings from which we will never be released, and there is no more important stewardship than the responsibility we have for God's spirit children who come into our families, close quote. I mentioned that my dad had a fifth grade education. I also mentioned that my siblings and I were teased a lot in school because we were Mormons. So my dad and mom would encourage us to do well in school. To my parents, this would be another way for us Mormons to preach the gospel and show that Mormons are really smart, and hopefully it will lessen the teasing and completely stop it. So no pressure there for me and my brother, but we did just that. In those days in elementary school in Fiti Uta, they have what we call lautongi, or cal calling of final grades, where all of our parents would come to school at the end of the school year, and the principal will call out loud the top three students of each class. It was a big deal. I'm happy to say that I was always first place in the top three kids of my class. And I even skipped grade and moved up to my brother's class and we graduated together in 1973 from Kahuku High School. Not bad, yeah? Pretty cool. I'm not sharing this for you, with you to boast about me. Well, maybe I am, it's okay, it was a long time ago. I'm old now. My parents were right about us doing well in school. We earned the respect from the principal and the teachers and even the kids of the village. They became our friends and the teasing stopped. We were known to be the smart Mormon kids. I have wonderful memories of my parents growing up and how much they, love, they have love for us and they would do anything for us to succeed, even in hard times. There will be times when we will lose our voice and would stop singing due to our disobedience to the Lord's commandments. I know my brother doesn't mind me sharing this. He is in the audience. My brother was an all-star football player from Kogu High School. He was an all-state and all-American. He had a full-ride scholarship to the University of Wyoming. My father loved watching his son play football, so when Wyoming was going to play BYU, he wanted to go to the mainland and watch that game. This was his first trip to the mainland. He stayed with my brother and his roommate. Wyoming beat BYU that year. My dad was happy for my brother and his team, but at the same time, he was sad. You see, it was constantly in his mind the fact that when he opened the refrigerator in my brother's apartment, he found the refrigerator full of cans of beer. Before my dad returned to Hawaii in his own father and son conversations and counseling, he told my brother, quote, if you do not honor your priesthood, you will never pay, play professional football. Long story short, my brother was invited to try out for the Oakland Raiders, and he got hurt, and he never had the opportunity to play pro football. My brother was bitter for a very long time, and he even told me that our dad cursed him. 
I told him that our dad did not curse him. He merely reminded him of his upbringing in the church, especially honoring his priesthood and how important that is in his life and all the blessings that come with it. He continued to be inactive, but just last year he called me from Montana. He says, did you send the missionaries to my home? I told him, no. He said, well, the missionary showed up in his home and he also invited him to go to church and he did go to sacrament meeting. I encouraged him to continue to go to church and also take his wife with him. I reminded him of his foundation in the church when we were young and that he needs to return back to church and enjoy the many wonderful blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is trying and hopefully he will return back to full activity in the church for I know it will bless his life and that of his family. On a side note, even though he didn't play pro football, he was inducted into the University of Wyoming Hall of Fame last year. I was able to go up to Wyoming and represented our family and supported my brother for this honor. How can we restore our voice and sing again? In President David Omake's uh, words, quote, the purpose of the gospel is to make bad men good and good men better, to change men's lives, close quote. President Omake's words are definitely true. Missionary work in Fitu Tumanua did not go unnoticed. The seeds of the gospel were planted and it has flourished decades later. Many of those kids that tease us, monga mongas or cockroaches, are now members of the church, have served as bishops and wives to bishops and Relief Society presidents. Some of them have become state presidents, both in Samoa and the mainland. Their children have served missions. I spoke with President Art Hanneman recently and he said missionary work is doing well in Manua. There's a couple missionary Fiti Uta and two sister missionaries. A high councilman who was here recently from Samoa told me that the Relief Society sisters Fiti Uta are ready to go to the temple to take out their own endowments in our Apia Samoa mission temple. We have a beautiful temple in Apia Samoa. That is so wonderful. I'm elated for the women of the church in Fiti Uta. He said the men are still working on the word of wisdom, but they will eventually see how important it is for them to be worthy and seal their families in the temple. Elder Ronald A. Rasbins talked in this past October conference titled, The Lord's Hand is Guiding You by Divine Design. Shared with us when President Thomas S. Munson said to uh, Elder Joseph B. Worthland, quote, there is guiding hand above all things. Often when things happen, it's not by accident. One day when we look back at the seeming coincidences of our lives, we will realize that perhaps they weren't so coincidental after all, close quote. I know and believe that everything that happened in my life up in Fiti Uta was not coincidental. Remember that one song that my mother taught me on the piano? My calling now in my ward is the organist. I didn't take any formal piano lessons. I only learned from my mother, but I took it upon myself to learn about sharps and flats and practice, and now I get to play a lot of songs and serve our Heavenly Father. I love our living prophet, Thomas S. Munson, and I know he is the mouthpiece of the Lord upon this earth. I love President Gordon B. Hinckley. He was a counselor to President Harold B. Lee in 1973 when he spoke these words in his talk entitled, quote, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet. We are the only church can properly sing, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet, for a prophet to guide us in these latter days. We either have a prophet or we have nothing, and having a prophet, we have everything, close quote. In conclusion, I would like to sing along with the choir as the choir are making their way right now to their place. Um, this beautiful song, What is this thing that men call death? President Gordon B. Hinckley wrote this poem. Janice Cap Perry was asked to put it to music. President Hinckley was our prophet at a time in my life when I lost my own voice. And through repentance, I was able to restore my voice and sing again. With my firm testimony of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, I will never ever lose my voice again. This beautiful song was sung at President Hinckley's funeral. It was actually, um, it's a poem, and Janice Cap Perry's niece was dying of cancer, I believe, and uh, she asked for permission to put this poem on her program and she asked her auntie to put it to music. And uh, Sister Perry asked President Hinckley's office for permission to um, put it to music and give it to, for everyone to know. And the pr approval came two weeks before President Hinckley passed, and it was sung at his funeral.
This is my testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our most precious Heavenly Father, we as we come to the end of this um, <coughs> devotional, we thank thee, Father, for thy spirit that was with us. Thank thee, Father, for the wonderful talks and messages that were shared. We ask thee, Father, at this time to please bless us as we depart from here, that we may be able to apply all that we have learned into our lives, and especially that we may be able to share it with our brothers and sisters. We ask thee, Father, to please bless our leaders here in school, and we ask thee, Father, to please bless the leaders of thy church, and especially our families back home. We ask thee, Father, to please forgive our wrongdoings and our shortcomings, and we humbly say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.